Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are going to dive right in. I'm so glad to see you here. Well, I wish I could see you, but we'll talk about that later. I know, like me, you're probably hoping for less frustration and more connection in your life. So let's look at the, the brainy ways that that can happen. If you have questions along the way, you should see a Q&A panel in your, in your Zoom um, somewhere everybody's screen is a little bit different, but feel free to to post something. Our fabulous administrative assistant Melanie Winters is on, so she'll field some of those if there's logistical things, so that I can just keep going. Um, so glad you're here. Here's why I'm doing this because I firmly believe that better brains make a better world. And to build better brains, uh, well, that's really why I founded Brave Brains, because I think there's so much out there that can help us build better brains, and it really begins with relationships. So I'm glad you're here. I wish I could meet each of you individually and um, hear your story, but at, at a minimum, I'd love to hear a little bit about you. So how you're parenting or if you're not currently parenting there's some options there and then what age is your parenting so you'll see those poll questions pop up thanks melanie um so feel free to answer those questions as i introduce myself and then we'll see a little bit of who's here with us so <clears throat> i started working in foster care before i even graduated from grad school and realized pretty quickly that i didn't know anything <laughs> Um, I, I really started the journey of figuring out what I needed to know um, to help the families that I was working with. So I started learning about the brain and that changed my professional and my personal life. And I really want everyone to have that same benefit. So that's why I founded Brave Brains, um, to provide some brain-based training and resources for home and school and mental health professionals and foster and adoption agencies. I work at a foster and adoption agency as a mental health counselor. That's my, my background, um, as well as a supervisor, getting more adoption competent mental health counselors out there in the world. It matters so much. Um, I also well, I cut my teeth on foster care, meaning I jumped in the deep end, because that's how that goes, uh, at Cardinal McCluskey Services in the Bronx, in New York City, and, and now um, serve on their board to help bring some of this brainy stuff their way. And I'm also the author of Riley the Brave, which is available in English and Spanish, Porque Yo Hablo Español. So Melanie, if you could share with us who is here. All right, we have a lot of parents by adoption, parents by birth, we've got um, parents in who are fostering, and a whole mix of other kinds of parenting. Um, lots of elementary students in our mix, and which is true for me as well. Those three gabagoos that you see on the screen are my, my three boys who are in kindergarten, third, and fifth. Um, it's been really interesting learning the brain science and attachment um, as I'm parenting children. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So welcome, I'm so glad you're here and let's keep going. Here's what I think every parent needs to know about the brain to react less, respond better and enjoy your kids more. Is it gonna happen every second of every day? Of course not, that's not realistic, but that's what I'm sharing with you in this hour. I could talk about this stuff uh, all day and all night, so I will I will keep it succinct. The nuts and bolts are brain development is relationship dependent. We do not we it is a hundred percent relationship de dependent. Do genetics matter? Yes, they do. But for a brain to develop in a healthy way, it requires relationship. In particular, it requires relationship to a well connected brain. So I'll tell you a little bit more what that means. You'll also see throughout the presentation today, some other resources. There are lots of people who have been doing this for quite a while, doing parts of this for quite a while, and I've learned from them um, immensely. So you'll see those on your screen. I want everybody to think about a newborn baby and how a newborn baby 
communicates their needs. So I have a handy dandy picture on the screen for you to remind you that the only way that a baby has to communicate is through crying, that their little brain um, flips into panic mode because babies cannot survive without a safe big critter. They can't survive without mama or dad or um, grandma or whoever it is that is providing care for them. And that care begins to develop their brain. So <clears throat> Dan Siegel coined the fist model of the brain. So if wherever you are, if you can hold up your hold up your hand and fold over your thumb. And if you're in your like office cubicle, you know, don't don't worry, people can see it, it's fine. So you're gonna fold over your thumb and fold your hand down over it. This is a model of your brain. This might be familiar to some of you, which is great. This is your, your spine and your brain stem coming up into this bottom part, which is your downstairs brain. Your thumb folds over and this little end here is your amygdala. You actually have two, you have one on either side. So your amygdala serves as the gatekeeper. Is this a threat situation that needs to shoot to my downstairs brain for survival? Or do I get to start developing this really special pathway to my upstairs brain? So your fingers here that fold over form this, this good human part of your brain, this, this prefrontal cortex and all of these rich networks that let us do human things. So what does that mean? Um, when I'm talking about connections, don't be scared. It's really about wiring. So if there are any electricians in, in the, the mix today, this will make tons of sense to you. Um, what, I, what I want you to see is that wiring is ha these, these little cell bodies. So what you see on your screen is a, um, a brain cell and that yellow part is called myelin and it serves as an insulator. And so that signals can go fast because an insulated wire sends signals faster than an uninsulated wire. And so that's what happens in our brain so that the, the parts of the brain can communicate with each other. So what we end up with is that wiring happening really fast. So now what you're looking at is Harvard University Center for the Developing Child. On the left, the newborn, those little globs, the dark parts of the globs are the cell body. Um, when you look from newborn to six months, you'll see about the same number of cell bodies, about the same number of globs. Um, that's the really fancy brain term for it, yeah. Um, but what you start to see is this branching, these dendrites, these little, these little reaching arms that are making those connections. And by two years, Oh my goodness, look at all those connections. One million new neural connections per second in those early years. That's why you might have heard of the, the bigger emphasis on zero to three initiatives. Brains are making connections at an astronomical rate. Um, so let's take a quick look at how that happens and where those connections are going. So I just, you know, again, we could spend days on, <laughs> on any one of these things, but it might sound obvious, but I think it's always important to remember that brain signals start from our senses. And so we, we think about the big five, you know, touch, sound, taste, sight, and smell, but there are three others that are essential for us to keep in mind. Um, the vestibular sense, so sort of your, your sense of balance, um, the pro proprioception, which is um, sort of those, those, the sense of self in space, um, so that's sort of exercised in, in banging, crashing, squeezing, all of those, those big sort of how you find, how you find your chair um, when you go to sit down, all of those things are part of proprioception and interoception <clears throat> is getting more press lately. So I know um, for those of us parenting kids who've maybe had some trauma history or um, who have some, some brain differences, that interoception is one of the things that can get interrupted, um, that it becomes really hard for a baby to tell what's going on in their body, like being hungry or um, having to go to the bathroom or some, some of those different body signals. When, when that little baby brain that cries to say that they have a need is, um, that need is maybe not met <clears throat> consistently or for some, 
physical or, or medical reason, that system sort of gets interrupted. So again, we could talk about this a long time, but those, I just want you to have a, in mind that our brain is taking in information from our senses. Um, and, and with our handy dandy amygdala here is deciding whether that information that it's taking in is going to the downstairs brain or the upstairs brain. And of course, you're gonna want to know more about those things if you don't already. So again, it was Dan Siegel that, and Tina Payne Bryson in The Whole Brain Child that uh, sort of brought this model to light. And then um, in Riley the Brave, we talk about it, I talk about it, um, especially in the afterward. So what is the upstairs brain and why does it matter? If we were all in a room together, I would, I would ask you if you think you would like kids who were young adults who were better at planning and organization and memory and time management and flexible thinking. And I'm guessing most of you would raise your hands. Um, in fact, I wanna be better at those things. I want my partner to be better at those things. These, this, is, this is your upstairs brain. It's, it's, um, it's in charge of all of these really fancy concepts um, and sort of functions like the CEO to make those things happen. Um, to flesh it out a little bit more and you'll you'll be able to um, come back to this at some point if you'd like we can upload a, a link afterwards to the handout so don't worry about like frantically writing um, we use our prefrontal cortex to do all of these things that um, that sort of happen through the course of of child development human development and it's easy to take for granted how that happens so um, so we use our upstairs brain to change habits, to understand cause and effect. So your six month old does not understand the cause and effect, right? Where your, um, where your six year old is going to have a better concept of that. And hopefully your 16 year old has an even better concept of that. However, if those connections between the downstairs, between the amygdala, the downstairs brain and the upstairs brain are not happening in a healthy way, are not growing in those beautiful, rich, connective ways, then that's gonna be harder. Um, dealing with complexity, problem solving, paying attention to boring stuff. So, you know, sitting here in this, in this webinar, you're using your upstairs brain. Hopefully it's not too boring, but that's this, human existence really requires so much of our upstairs brain, especially when it comes to controlling strong emotions, developing insight, um, persevering. These are all upstairs brain things. So those things kind of made sense to me, right? When I started learning about the brain science. Yeah, sure, that seems like brainy stuff, um, paying attention to boring things or organizing. What was surprising to me Right now it makes sense in hindsight, but what was surprising to me was this part. So play is an upstairs brain thing. Um, to, to be immersed in a joyful experience really requires us to be in this social approach engagement system of our brain. Finding joy in the company of others is an upstairs brain thing. Sharing, we're not born knowing how to share. We have to develop the connections that, that tell our amygdala uh, it's, not a, it's not a danger, danger, danger signal when I have to um, share part of my snack or um, a toy with a sibling. That because, because the primal brain is gonna say, I want everything for myself. I wanna make sure I'm doing everything I can to survive thinking in a pro-social way. So thinking cooperatively instead of against each other and how do I, how do I you know, survive on my own without needing you? That's, that's very much an upstairs brain thing. And that's part of my theory that better brains will make a better world because I think we would find less war and conflict if we were all living a little bit more in our upstairs brains responding instead of reacting. We all have moments when we say something we wish we hadn't, we have those downstairs brain moments. So let's look a little bit at the downstairs brain. It's really, it's really your survival brain. So when a baby's born, everything is life-threatening. So, so being hungry or 
um, or having a wet diaper or being cold or being tired, those are all the, the signals come into the amygdala and it says panic, panic, panic. And hopefully a big safe caregiver comes along who has their lid on, who has their upstairs brain engaged and says, oh, it's okay. I got you, I got you, I got you. And we hold and we soothe and we, and we comfort to, to help that brain start growing connections that, that tell it, tell the amygdala, okay, when this hunger signal comes in, I don't necessarily have to panic right? At, as a newborn, babies are um, only soothed when the need is met. You, you, all, the, all the cooing and, and loving and binky and everything that, that you want to throw at a baby is not going to cut it until they are drinking milk, right? When you get to three months old, you might be able to hold and bounce and so we got proprioceptive and we're and we've got sound and we've got touch and we've got vestibular sense we've got all these senses that are that are soothing that amygdala and letting the baby know okay oh that's right that's right that's right amygdala when i'm hungry my safe big critter gives me food and it was thousands of times i wanted a clicker when my kids were little when my when my last was born especially of how many times a day you meet a need to lay down those super speed highways those myelinated neurons to the upstairs brain it's a lot it's a lot and it's exhausting as parents um when that hasn't happened well um or when a baby is born sort of primed for fight or flight because um because even in utero life has been stressful, then that's that's even it's even harder to make those connections. At six months, um, maybe you can be across the room. Baby gets the little hunger signal. It hits the amygdala, but you're saying, "I see you, I see you," and I'm giving you your, I'm getting your, I'm getting your food. You see it, don't you? And you use your motherese, you use your like sing song voice, and you get that little brain to calm down, right? And and again, you're laying down those super speed highways. What happens when our, when our downstairs brain gets more of the highways um, is that we're living in this, we're living in defense mode. We're living in survival and quick reactions and it's primal emotions. Um, in, instead of being this social approach engagement mode that says, oh, safe big critter, my caregiver, I, um, I do like you, I enjoy you, I can feel comfort in your presence. Those are all, those are all upstairs brain things. Um, and so when that's not happening, we get little flipped lids that want to figure out how to control their world and, um, you know, to the whatever else may be. Um, so that's, that's a tricky place to be. So let's, and that's what I've seen happen again and again and again, and have struggled with, okay, what do we do about it? So we know that we're in this tough spot where downstairs brains kick in. And the, the hard part with downstairs brains is um, flipped lids beget flipped lids. So, you know, you've seen it happen, you know, somebody gets tense um, and like you're at the, um, the counter at the airport and they've lost your bag and you're angry what happens if the person who's helping you gets angry too then it just escalates from there so flip lids beget flip lids throughout life regardless of um, if you're a kid or not it really takes some effort to keep your upstairs brain engaged when someone else is not right so part of what i want to do with brave brains is bring some stories and resources that can help take the shame out of the downstairs brain moments as we as we work to foster more of those good healthy connections with the upstairs brain so that was the part of the purpose of riley the brave the book um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what's introduced in story form because story hits a different part of the brain <laughs> than other things um, so let's let's dive in there basically what i i think is really helpful to hold on to is that when we face adversity our brains find ways to survive. We are resilient. Part of that survival doesn't, often doesn't look very pretty. Uh, and so that's what, what I have found in my work with families can get really difficult, um, is that it's hard to stay engaged. It's hard for, for loving parents to, to keep their upstairs brains engaged 
when they're faced with that sort of downstairs brain stuff coming at them all day long. So if we want to think about the, the downstairs brain in a little bit clearer terms, you might have heard of fight or flight. Um, so, so that is an active defense system. In Riley the Brave, I talk about it as having a tiger moment or having a porcupine moment. A tiger moment would, um, you know, these are these are ways of protecting yourself actively, right? So I have power in this. I'm going to do something. I'm going to, uh, all the blood's going to go to my muscles and I'm either going to fight it out or I'm going to run away. Um, and so that's sort of your, your fight or flight mode. There's also freeze or feign death. So even lower, it's actually a little bit lower system, is this freeze or feign death. So in, in Riley the Brave, I talk about it in terms of a turtle moment or a chameleon moment um, where you might want to just blend into the background. Like I tend to have chameleon moments when I'm um, in a room full of new people and I don't have anybody that I know. I'm not, small talk is not my, strongest <laughs> suit. I would love to hear your whole life story, but as far as like chatting about the weather, I'm not so great at that. Um, so I have this like, I just kind of want to shrink and disappear. Um, turtle moment, you know, when you sort of feel like you have to protect yourself and, and curl up in your shell. This is an important one that I think doesn't get a lot of press. Um, having a squirrel moment is so i just want you to look at little riley bear's face there again if we were in the room together i think most of you would come up with terms like happy or excited or um accomplished or i did it like those kinds of things to describe his face because he got all the things for himself and it feels good when you can provide for yourself especially if you didn't have somebody that provided for you or if your brain learned even very 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 early including in utero to to self-provision to take care of yourself that that was going to be the safer way to live what it looks like is being super manipulative um, it looks like stealing and sneaking and lying and um and it doesn't feel good it doesn't it it doesn't feel um it, it's not often a trait that you want to connect with, but it is a defense mode. And, um, and really, honestly, we can all have those moments where we think we need to, uh, we need to take care of ourselves because the, the rest isn't gonna happen. So what do we do? What do we do when the behaviors that keep kids alive in some settings are the same things that get them in trouble in other settings? And, and, Mm -hmm. Again, I could, I could go on and on, but we also have to think about what, what do we do if that's happening to us as adults? What's been interesting in this journey since writing the book, which is, um, it came out about a year and a half ago, I've heard from a lot of adults who are having these aha moments of like, that's what's happening to me. I don't like to share food. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm having a squirrel moment. I'm I'm not saying for me, but like I've had people share with me, like I'm, you know, 35 years old and I just realized like that's, that's what was happening. It's primal. It's in my guts and I, I don't like it. And it can feel like a shameful thing until you bring it to the light of day. And so that's the hope in our conversation today. And in hopefully where, where you take these things going forward is if we can suck the shame out of some of the things that our brains do to protect us, man, I think it makes for much better relationships. So um, you'll see the book there by Dr. Harris. Um, she has a, a lot of a very hopeful take on what we can do with some of these things. I highly recommend it. Um, because part of what we're trying to do, excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold. <laughs> what we're trying to do is hold compassion for the source of those downstairs brain moments. Whether they happen because of trauma or they happen because we're human and it's just a little bit how we're wild, wired, if we can hold compassion for where that stuff is coming from, we have a lot better chance of noticing, nurturing, and celebrating upstairs brain moments. So, so that's part of what 
Brave Brains tries to do and Riley the Brave tries to do. So we're gonna, um, you can find the Upstairs Brain Moments with Riley the Brave on your left at, um, at rileythebrave.org or bravebrains.com. It's part of the It's a Brain Thing resource. I, as, as I work with communities and people, I often bring out the joy plan or, you know, nurturing your upstairs brain. Those are kinds of things we do in workshops to just keep the focus on point, that it's not all about behavior reduction. Do we want to reduce negative behavior? Absolutely. And we're going to do it by noticing where it's coming from and and really tuning into some of the upstairs brain things that might be happening that we don't even realize are upstairs brain things. So one of the most powerful things we have um, at our disposal is the breath. So what we're gonna do right now, and again, if you're in a public place, I, I mean, I encourage you to do it anyway. You don't have to be physical with it uh, in order to to do it. So you can keep your eyes open and still do the same breathing. But if you can, take your right hand, put it on your chest, take your left hand and put it on your belly. And we're going to take three big deep breaths. You can keep your eyes open or closed. It's totally up to you. Ready, go. Two more. Try to let your belly go out. Last one. And if I'm the only one doing this and you're all just watching me do it, you know, that's on you because it's really calming. So if you want to jump on the chat and, and write down some of the things that you notice in how you feel in your body or in your, um, in your body or in your emotions, just with three deep breaths. I see your pulse slows. Shoulders less tense. I find that a lot. I carry, I'll, I know when I'm stressed because suddenly I'm walking around with my shoulders and my ears. Um, everything's slowed. It's easier to listen. So again, that like listening and taking in information is an upstairs brain thing. Heart rate slows. Release of tension. This is so great. Tension release. Slow down. Started to relax after the second deep breath. Stomach in, inflated first, then chest. That's great. Calmer, mo more focused. How wonderful. And what's really cool is we're able to stop trying to multitask. I like that. Thanks, Martha. Um, what's really cool is our, um, our kids can do this too. So keeping in mind that our kids that maybe have more of a trauma history and, and being still can feel threatening, like being still puts that little amygdala on on alert, um, that we have to be playful in how we do it. So I, I talk more about that in other workshops. Um, but yeah, grab this resource. Again, it's also on rileythebrave.org or bravebrains.com. And it just kind of walks through it, how you can do it with your kids um, to make it, to make it a, a way to slow your body down. Um, let me get back on here. And, um, and those resources, by the way, like the, the power up to calm down and it's a brain thing, those are free. I, I really want to keep as much as I can free for everybody because I'm, I'm passionate about getting this out in the world in a, in a useful way. So let's, let's look at these downstairs brain moments. I'm just going to take, it looks like I have one question. So I'm going to take this question and if somebody else has a question they want me to pause for, go ahead and put it in the chat as well. Um, wondering when you refer to downstairs brain, does this include emotional dysregulation? Yes, definitely. So the um, so if you're thinking about emotional dysregulation, and I think I think it'll partly be answered in these next couple of slides. So if you're still wondering about that, go ahead and, and pop back on the Q&A. Um, but it absolutely has to do with emotional dysregulation because remember, the downstairs brain is the home of those big primal emotions and the upstairs brain is what helps regulate them. So I, if, if I don't hit that in those ne the next few slides, feel free to, to jump back on. Any other questions I should get to now? All right, so I'm excited about this. I've started doing this as, I, as I'm working with adults because what I continue to realize is because 
relation because growing a healthy brain requires connection to a, a healthy brain really we have to look at what we're doing in ourselves to be able to help the kids that we want to help it doesn't mean it's all your fault it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect um, because repair is actually a beautiful part of of growing the upstairs brain so this is not like a this is not a you're doing things wrong or um, here's seven more to do's for you. It's really a way for us to step back and notice what's going on in our own brain. So let's let's look at what these things are. Having a tiger moment, acting big and scary, yelling, name calling, breaking things, right? So that's pretty significant um, emotional dysregulation. Invading other space, running away, all of these things that are um, that are big fight kinds of things. As I've been talking about the stuff around the country, tiger moments seem to be the biggest, the biggest problem. It's it's dangerous. It's hard, um, and we all have tiger moments. So maybe it doesn't get to the point where you um, break things, but we really we do all have these moments when we um, when we raise our voices or when we want to run from a situation. So what I want to I want you to think about right now is is looking at acting big and scary yelling like this th that feeling that visceral feeling of tiger think of a time you felt that way you need to give me a second and where do you feel it in your body and again you can type responses in the chat so we can sort of share that together I feel it up the back of my neck. So my the back of my neck gets hot. Shoulders and chest. Yep. Flushed face. Yes. Which is embarrassing, right? Because then everybody knows. <laughs> um, throat, tummy, neck, back, shoulders, heartbeat, boils up from my gut. Absolutely. Chest, heart pounding, right? This is a this is a body thing. This is big and visceral. Um, clenching fist, you bet, shaking. And and again, sometimes it feels so out of control. Like we can't. Um, we can't pull it back in. So when you have a tiger moment or when you're close to having a tiger moment, what do you need? What, is you, what does your body and your brain need to be able to come back? So your amygdala is saying, alert, 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 and your lid is flipping or flipped and your downstairs brain is, is running the show. What do you need? What would help? Go ahead and type some responses in oh boy reassurance and to feel understood it is so powerful a hug a break on my own I don't need somebody in my face saying like bah, 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 bah. you need to calm down that has never calmed me down <laughs> um, quiet ability to breathe remember to use the tools I have right so sometimes I find if I can take a breath my kids know now um, walking to be heard good ones if my kids know if I, if they see me like kind of close my eyes and take a breath, <laughs> they're like, mom's trying not to get mad. Like, you're damn straight, I'm trying not to get mad. Um, right, I feel attacked when, when with that, you need to calm down phrase. It's so, it's so tough um, because really we need, we need somebody to understand that this is big and we don't want to feel this way, right? So space, a deep breath, or five <laughs> without interruption. And those are hard. Those are hard to get, especially if the kids are um, fighting or, you know, dinner's on the stove or like you, you just got a call from work and you're trying to deal with this other thing. So it's not easy. It's not as, as um, cut and dry. And that's part of why having something like your breath with you at all times and some practice at getting your body calm can be really helpful because it, it really does take a minute to get this brain back online. It's a brain thing. It's not because you're a failure or you're a jerk or you're a terrible mom or dad or aunt or um, grandpa. It's, it, it's the, that it takes some time for this connection to, to form back up, to get that highway back online to say, okay, okay. Of all the stressful days, I have survived every single one so far. I will survive this one too. Um, but that's not, that's not what our body's doing when the blood runs to our fists and up the back of our neck. So tiger moment. 
let's think about, we're going to do the same thing with, with each of these five. So when you're having a porcupine moment, it's, um, you know, it's similar. We're still in that sort of fight or flight space, but it's more of that grumpy and negative. It's like the, it's sort of the poking others. Like you, you know, I, one of my kiddos has a tendency to do this more than the others where they're just kind of, just kind of seeing if they can push your buttons. Um, predicting the worst is sort of that catastrophic thinking, that irritable, snappy teasing. It, it feels like a porcupine. It feels prickly and yucky and sort of stuck in their downstairs brain. Um, think about the last time you felt that way. And where do you feel it in your body? For me, porcupine, I feel like my thoughts really swirl when I'm in porcupine mode and I feel it right here. Like I get, yeah, there you go. Mind, self-talk, yep, brain mush. Isn't that interesting? Um, isolated, oof, right? And it's, it becomes this double-edged sword because you you feel isolated because everything feels terrible. And then you kind of isolate more by poking your little porcupine quills up. Um, yeah, it doesn't feel good. And so what do you need? What do you need? Ooh, clenching jaw, yep. Right, it's tense. You can even see it in Riley. His little, his little jaw tensed. Um, I had porcupine months. I know, I know. Um, yeah, yeah. So what do you need? when you're having a porcupine moment, when you are feeling prickly and negative and the worst. I feel like I'm going down a drain of negativity. Yeah, a hug, validation, space. So it's interesting too, and this is part of where it's good to know yourself, soothing, music, empathy, space. It's so important to know yourself and to know your partner and to know your, um, your kids because we respond differently. Someone to listen, change of scenery, downtime, support, date night. Ooh, that's a big one for me. I need, I need some fun in my life if I'm getting porcupine-y. Um, a light moment, a joke, yeah. Um, and for some, for someone, a joke might need, um, a, a joke might be helpful. And for someone, it might feel like you're not validating them. So these things are complicated. Our, our brains are unique, even though there's so much overlap. Um, stop ruminating so I read right so you know that you have to take a break Martha and and read for a minute space time something positive a joke makes me mad when I feel mad right so isn't that isn't that interesting agreed upon phrase that's a fun one the sort of um, we do code words in our family sometimes um, music it's a good one so I just want you to to sit with this. Like we have all this wonderful insight from parents uh, across the country, around the world. I, I'm so grateful for your vulnerability in sharing these things because this is how we grow our brains. So having a turtle moment, let's, let's switch modes into sort of that freeze, feign death um, feeling. Unable to talk, hiding the real me, hard to let others help, tired, lethargic feeling sad and alone, the sort of like, I'm gonna pull the covers up over my head and pretend this all doesn't exist. Um, think of when it happened and where you feel it in your body. Like my blood is molasses, whole body feels heavy, muscle fatigue, yep. Yeah, I feel like I can't get going. Like I can see the way forward kind of in the back of my brain, but I, I can't I can't get there. Like I'm in a tunnel, shut down all emotions, cold, tired, um, need space, need to rest. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point. I think I think it's really important for us to know that these downstairs brain moments, sometimes they can get big and disruptive and throw our upstairs brain offline. Sometimes they can be a clue for ourselves that there's a need um, and it doesn't have to go into full, you know, full turtle mode. It's just that like, I, I need a turtle moment. I need to, I need to protect myself for a minute and that's okay, right? So this isn't, 
this isn't um, a negative. I need to press pause. I need to press pause. That's right. So you'll see Jessica Sinarski pop up on there because Melanie is in um, it anyway. So that's that's why my name <laughs> keeps popping up. Um, yeah, that I I shared this a couple months ago that. Um, yeah, it clues you in when I feel my shoulders tense or when I feel that sort of ruminating happening that I need to slow down. Can't get out of bed easily. That's right. Yeah. And I'm guessing for all of you, this is true for me, that it doesn't, you're not trying to be that way. You're not trying to be a bummer, you know, or a, a, a party pooper it's it's your your body your brain and your body having this response and so if we can figure out what it's communicating to us maybe we can help it reconnect if that makes sense having a chameleon moment this one tends to be the trickiest to to pinpoint though i still think it's really helpful to pay attention to because some of our, our chameleons and our turtles they might not get as much i shouldn't say that our kiddos, our brave cubs who have chameleon and turtle moments, sometimes don't get as much attention as the ones who have those, those outside, um, those external behaviors. But chameleon moments are just as real, feeling nervous, just wanting to blend in, not being able to show the, the real you, embarrassed by attention, including praise. How many of you maybe deal with this yourself or have kids who can't hear anything positive about themselves without um, dismissing it or getting embarrassed or you know, sort of um, shutting it down, feeling paralyzed, unsure of yourself, awkward with others. Um, like I shared before, that's part of, that happens to me when I'm um, with, with people that I don't know sometimes that I'll get that like, um, that's me, the chameleon, yeah, yeah. So where do you feel it in your body when you have that, like, I just want to disappear into the walls feeling? Belly tight, gut, stomach, mind, my chest, in my face. Yep. Nauseated, you bet. I, I so relate to that. Tummy, heaviness, face, having a chameleon moment um, can just sort of, I mean, it, it, it's a freeze, right? It's this uh, feeling, what do you need in that moment? I need somebody safe. That's, that's mine. I need, so sometimes I'll excuse myself to like make a phone call or no eye contact. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. So if we have kiddos who are having chameleon moments, it's not, it might not be the time to say like, look, look me in the eye, um, because you just might not be able to in that moment when your nervous system is saying everything's dangerous. Also need someone you think is safe. Yeah, yeah. That helps us through. It doesn't go away. So that whole like, um, you know, a, a well-connected brain helps another brain um, that doesn't go away magically when you're like 18 we still need that I still have moments when I'm super upset and need somebody who has their lid on to help me get my lid back on need support you bet let's look at this tricky squirrel moment um, <clears throat> so while it can be the sneaking lying stealing hoarding um, it can also just be that insatiable need, that feeling unsatisfied. So it, it might be stockpiling resources, having a hard time um, sharing, only satisfied when self-sufficient. So, you know, I, I think probably a number of our parents by adoption and, and foster care can relate to that feeling of like, oh, sure, it's fine when the school counselor gives you a coat, but if I give you a coat, that's a terrible plan. Um, and you don't care at all because that that means I didn't that for that kiddo it means I didn't provide for myself and that's scary. Sometimes um, it can sometimes feel great but be off putting to others. So some of that like braggy um, grandiose stuff like I did it you know I got this I don't feel I don't need um, that can be that same sort of squirrel moment where like I got this on my own. So. Um, I, I will share a little story here because 
I, I think about this sometimes. I, I do some workshops on like lying and stealing, and so I'll share this sometimes. The, there was a time I, um, I had used something at the office that I thought was for everybody. This was years ago. Used something at the office that I thought was for everybody. And then somebody walked in um, and, and was like in a huff, like clearly was, had a, a bit of a flipped lid and was ranting about how could somebody, you know, use the blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, people are so inconsiderate and, you know, I don't know in here did it. And, or I don't remember what they said, but basically there was an out there. It didn't feel like there was an out for me to say like, oh, I didn't realize and I did it. Um, regardless, fully grown woman, I lied and said that I hadn't done it. I was so embarrassed afterwards that, that I was like, oh my gosh, not only did I do this thing, but then I lied about it because suddenly my fear brain took over. My downstairs brain took over. And, you know, I don't think I was necessary. I wasn't stockpiling resources. Um, but those, the, I just mentioned that to say that for our kids who, who have developed sneaking, lying, hoarding as a um, way to survive, that that automatic reaction when they're feeling threatened is even stronger than it was in me as a full grown adult. Um, so anyway, so stockpiling resources might mean goodwill from others. Yes. Um, right. So it's a, it's a way to have, to have something, um, somebody else shared a story where a kid at an event had, there were free hamburgers at this event and then they went, they were leaving and one kid kept coming up and getting free ham hamburgers. And then as the organizers were leaving the event, they went down the pathways and the kid, <laughs> the same kid had set up a little stand and was selling the hamburgers that he'd been getting. Well, what a great survival strategy. Um, because they were finding a way to, you know, to make ends meet. Am I saying like that we want to encourage that and let kids do it? No, of course not. But if we can see the source of the behavior, it's often easier to understand it. So we've all had squirrel moments. We've all had those times when we want what somebody else has. A lot of times it feels like jealousy um, or, or unsatisfied or that insatiable need. Um, so this is a bold one, but where do you feel it in your body when that happens? I think mine's in my gut. It's a tricky one and kind of kind of vulnerable, which you can relate to our kids who struggle with this, it being a really vulnerable one to talk about. Um, in my head and arms for some reason, my head, yep, head and arms, yep. Gut, sure. Heart, keeping myself safe, right? So it's this, it's protective. If I do this myself, then I don't have to trust you. It's this, you know, it's sort of that, that feeling. Yeah. And what do you need in that moment? Panicky feeling, racing heart, yep. To get my way. Uh, if only. I think that's what my, my son would say when he's having a squirrel moment. Because I'll say it to him. I'm like, oh, buddy, it's like you're having a squirrel moment. And, and he'll, you know, sort of give me that look that kids give. Um, and then we'll sort of playfully get our way out of it. Compassion, a hug, time. I need to reason why I'm feeling this. Yep. Someone to loving comfort, lovingly comfort, confront me. Yep. Right. So sometimes it's that safe big critter that can be a, a safe mirror for you or a safe like, all right, come on, we'll get through this control, some level of control. So it might be the thing that you wanted. It might not be the thing that you wanted, but if you can recognize where you do have control, at least for me, that can be helpful. There are all these things that are outside of my control, but if I can see this one thing that, that I can control, to be asked what I need by a safe person, sure, yeah. So I know I know that's kind of a deep dive into these moments, um, but I found it so helpful for myself and for the the families that I work with to know these things in ourselves in ourselves, 
and then have this language to be able to talk to our kids because our kids struggle like our kids don't understand you know feeling an insatiable need or um you know stockpiling resources or even some of this this visceral stuff but they understand animals they understand that feeling you know feeling like a tiger that seems to that seems to resonate with a lot of our a lot of the kids that i see and so if we can know these things about ourselves, we have a much better shot of helping our kids through these same moments. So the next time you feel like this, um, and I know it's not just me that feels like that on a fairly regular basis, my encouragement to you is to pause and breathe and remember that it's a brain thing. So in that moment, it might be helpful to ask, what do I need and what does my child need? I'm gonna take some questions. I know some people probably have to run, um, get back from lunch, but feel free to, to post any questions either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, first question is, will these behaviors get better over time or will they still be behaving like this as adults? I think that's, a, that's an important, important question um what i would say is i i would say it's a um i would say it's a both and so the behaviors absolutely will can get better over time because our brains are plastic so the the super joyful thing is even though there's all that connection happening in the those first three years our brains are still growing and changing and shifting until we die through the entire lifespan and so part of why i'm so passionate about about understanding the upstairs and downstairs brain is it helps me know what i'm trying to nurture in my kids so that it can quiet this upstairs brain because the or downstairs brain i'm sorry because the upstairs brain is a regulator so when you have when when a kiddo has a big tiger moment um part of what starts to happen is as kids get to know their bodies and brains better they might be able to catch it before it's a full flip so they're catching it when they're starting to get grumpy and they might be able to take a breath or go for a walk or punch the bag or um, they, they might need you as the parent to know, um, to know some of those needs. So I, I just had a conversation with um, a kiddo and mom about when he, you know, one of the ways his tiger moments were coming out um, is that he was threatening his sister. Well, that's not okay. And so we were talking through how, what he needs in that moment and it turned you know he has some sensory processing stuff going on and one of the things that seems to be helpful for him is some playful pressure so he has these big stuffed animals and so getting some playful um pressure when he's when he's starting to flip can dial that down so he doesn't go into full tiger moment um so not only are is 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 there less of the behavior because it's been really helpful so mom works with him on that and we also talked about like okay and you know you don't have to threaten your sister to get me to like you know play with you with this stuffed animal um the and so we're getting less of the behavior while also growing his upstairs brain and and showing him that mom is safe and that he can solve problems and and so and when he starts to get that feeling that it doesn't immediately short circuit to fight that he can he can crawl that pathway up to social approach engagement and get help from mom so that's a long-winded answer for um there it, it absolutely can get better however we all still have these moments. I have porcupine moments. I bark at my kids sometimes. I get annoyed with my spouse. I, um, you know, I, we can't live in our upstairs brain 100% of the time. So hopefully that's that's helpful. So from Deb, um, tigers and porcupines and squirrels every day. I know it's so hard. I'm glad you're here, Deb. When our children have a moment in front of other people, how do we remove them without? Um, without embarrassing them so that is a tricky one i think i think it's part of where this language can be helpful so if you can do this is hard to demonstrate without another person but um so i'm gonna grab whatever i have here so if your kiddos having a tiger moment but you've already had the convert like if you've already introduced this language in a calm moment then you might be able to come alongside um and sort of wrap around and say like oh um in fact one time 
I, um, so my youngest is still little enough, I can kind of scoop him up. Um, he's getting out of that range, but he was starting to have a tiger moment. And I remember I had scooped him up. And when we got out of the room, um, I started singing from the Big Bang Theory, like soft kitty, warm kitty. But I did it in, I did it with Tom, Tiger, like soft kitty, growly kitty or whatever. Um, and it was enough playfulness, but with understanding where he was, that he was able to, to shift. Um, so I think, I think this language can be helpful as a precursor because then it it's it's a signal that might wake up the upstairs brain in that moment enough for you to get out of the situation when two kids are fighting with each other it is only verbal and it is only verbal is it best to interfere or let them solve their conflict on their own that um hector that is a great question and unfortunately is sort of a case-by-case -case situation um so so sometimes absolutely it's helpful to to let them sort it out um, especially if you're working on the skills outside of that time so if you have some one-on-one -on -one time with each of them or if you're able to have a family meeting about um, how we're going to solve conflicts or those kinds of things it can it can help if it's if it's verbal and there's clearly a a winner and a loser and it's not sort of a fair fight, if you want to call it that, then it might be helpful to interfere, um, especially if you can do it in a um, in an empowering way of, of, you know, letting them know ways that they can solve the problem, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, we got that answered. Are there resources for teens to help them understand what's going on? Yeah, so this is a, this is tricky. I do, the, the hope over time is to expand resources for um, those middle grades and upper grades. For between parent and child, um, it, it's really varied on whether or not they'll read Riley the Brave with a parent. Sometimes professionals can get away with it. So like a counselor or a teacher can get away with it. And some of our biggest responses, some of the biggest things that I've heard from um, professionals especially have been about teens and adults um, but even without even without reading the book if you wanted to explain the concepts because again it's going on in all of our brains whether we're kids or adults um, that can that can be helpful so tempting to keep explaining to my kids how they're being mean to each other in the moment ah I know Martha preaching the choir never works but I have a hard time diffusing them when they're both going at it. So I really think in that moment, sometimes that the the pause, that if we can if we can get really good at at the pause, um, both for ourselves and for enacting it with our kids, like nope, yep, yep, separate, 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 no, nope, separate corners, separate corners. I know, whew, I know, I know. Bright lids are flipped, lids are flipped. Like, um, sort of matching their energy, but but helping them. Um, pause if that makes sense um from aaron any advice for helping kids age 10 with anxiety and being good enough um lots of advice so i i do think still again that's a that's a brain thing and so um it's helpful to to find those upstairs brain moments so like if you'll see on the on the poster that calm body so the belly breathing gentle hands focused mind do my best doesn't mean be perfect but do my best those things can be helpful there are also other resources like um anxiety says what and um there's another good one about perfectionism i the good seed or the bad seed i can't remember i think it's the good seed um so there are, there are a number of good children's books about anxiety specifically and some websites and stuff um, so if you're still curious, feel free to email and, and we'll get you some of those. In fact, Melanie Winters may have some good resources for you as well. So slides will be made available. We'll make sure and send those out to you. I think we have everyone's email address so we can get that to you. And I really appreciate your time. Remember, if you are interested in bringing some of these resources home, take advantage of the buy one, get one sale. You'll just need to enter the promo code WebX. It is case sensitive at RileyTheBrave.org. Um, and we have some new posters up there too to try to make sense of the um, upstairs, downstairs brain moments and help us tune in. So thanks so much, everybody. I'm really glad you're here. Bye.